What's up, Concordia High School? It is great to be with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who may have forgotten who I am, my name is Ted. I'm the pastor at Narrative Church. Uh, we're meeting online right now, kind of like everybody else, but I just wanted to, to send you guys a word this morning. Artha got in touch with me. She said, hey, you got, you got something you can share with our students. And so this morning, I want to share a little bit with you. You can tell nothing fancy here. I'm in, I'm in my living room, just, you know, shooting with a, my phone and uh, a light. And it's, it's you know, a, a place to be. But I wanted to talk to you this morning about this guy named Joseph. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, there's a, a guy named Joseph. And Joseph is uh, one of many brothers. And Joseph ends up being this brother who has a lot of special abilities. And I don't know if you have a brother or sister who you look at and go, oh my gosh, they just have so much ability in our family. I've got a, a younger brother and an older sister. And our joke is that uh, my sister's the smart one. She went to uh, Concordia University in Nebraska, but then got her master's at uh, Yale Medical School. So, you know, pretty smart. Uh, my kid brother, Matt, who plays music when I come and lead chapel, he's the tall one, and I just landed as the funny one. But it's it's one of those things, you know, sibling rivalries, right? So this guy, Joseph, his dad really likes him. He's got all these abilities. And what happens is, is Joseph has a dream. And in this dream, he sees all these things happening, and he interprets it and says, like, hey, there were these hay bales that bowed down to another hay bale. And he tells his brothers, like, you're the ones that bowed down and you're going to bow down to me. And let me tell you, as an older brother, if my younger brother rolled in and goes, hey, I had this dream. And what it means is you're going to be bowing down to me. We'd be throwing some, you know, throwing some fists there. Maybe not fists, but like we'd be wrestling on the ground for sure. And I may be old, but I got old man strength on him. So I'd, I'd take care of business. But, you know, so now his brothers are frustrated. They're angry. Well, then their dad gives Joseph this coat. And the Bible tells us it's a coat of many colors, which to us is like big deal. You know, I could go get that at Goodwill. But back then, dyeing cloth took a lot of time and preparation and money. So a coat of many colors would have been a huge deal. So Joseph gets this coat. Well, now his brothers just get keep. They're more and more upset. Well, what ends up happening is they're out one day taking care of the livestock and they go, listen, let's get rid of Joseph. Like, let's just take care of business. I'm mad at him, you're mad at him. Let's just get rid of him. So they decide they're gonna take care of Joseph. So they throw him down in a pit. They take his clothes, tear him up, put blood on it. And they're planning to just leave him in the pit to die. But then they see some slave traders coming by and they go, hey, we can make some money off this. So they sell Joseph into slavery and they take back the bloody coat to their dad and say well Joseph was eaten by a lion which you know as we all know is the greatest excuse of all time to give for the reason why your brother or sister is missing like you know uh, they were eaten by a lion so Joseph's dad grieves and mourns well Joseph goes to Egypt and he ends up being a servant there and his life is not very easy, but he moves up the ranks. Well, he, he ends up being under this guy. The guy's name is Potiphar, and Potiphar is uh, an Egyptian noble, and he's, you know, a, an advisor to the pharaoh, the king. And so Joseph's life is getting pretty good because he keeps moving up. He keeps uh, growing in stature. He keeps uh, being the guy that Potiphar relies on. Well, apparently Joseph is a pretty good-looking guy, and Potiphar, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and Joseph's like, I'm having none of that, and runs out so quickly that Potiphar's wife grabs a hold of his cloak, and he just slips out of it and leaves it behind. Well, she is so upset that he spurned her that she lies and says that, you know, Joseph made advances on her, and look, here's his cloak to prove it. So Joseph, having gone from being thrown in a pit to having become an important servant in this household, now gets thrown in prison again. Now, while he's in prison, he meets uh, two of Pharaoh's people, his cupbearer and his baker. And they have these dreams, and he interprets the dreams. And um, this cupbearer and this baker go before Pharaoh again. And um, Pharaoh's having a lot of issues, but Pharaoh's having dreams that people can't interpret. Well, to save their own skin, one of them says, well, we know this guy in prison who can interpret your dreams. Well, they bring Joseph back up out of prison, and he comes before Pharaoh and says, oh, yeah, no, here's what this means. It means that there's... Seven good years coming, but there's going to be seven years of famine. You need to start preparing now. And 
Pharaoh ends up elevating Joseph to be his right-hand man and take care of all this stuff. Now, all this is kind of precursor to, to what happens next, which is um, they store up of seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine hit. And so as this famine hits, Joseph's brothers who are in another country say, hey, we hear that you know Egypt has grain, so we're gonna go down there and see if we can get some grain. So they go down and through all of these events, they end up being put in front of Joseph, who Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And there's all this stuff that happens and ends up finally, he reveals who he is. He takes care of them. He has them bring the whole family down to live with him. And it's it's interesting because the, the people of Egypt look at Joseph and who, who they love because he is taking care of them. He saved them from this famine. And so as that's happened, when, uh, the people of Joseph, so his brothers, his parents, his family come in. Uh, they're given this land called Goshen, and Goshen is kind of like the the prime place. But all the Egyptians are so excited, and and they are actually weeping and rejoicing for Joseph because they love him so much, and they say Joseph's family, who was lost, has now been found, and they're just so excited. Well, um, Joseph's brothers are still a little skittish, right? They sold him into slavery, and so they're struggling with you know is Joseph he's got all this power is he gonna you know is he gonna return the favor is he gonna take care of us now and kill us well while their father's alive they feel like they have protection their father you know will take care of them but there's this point towards the end of the story where uh, Joseph's dad dies and the brothers once again are afraid and, and I want to read you this section of scripture and this is from uh, Genesis 50 and it starts at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke to them kindly. So Joseph, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all the evil that's been done to him, in the midst of all the ups and downs, as time takes place and he's able to step back and see what happens when his brothers come to him and they're afraid, right? They're fearful that Joseph's going to enact justice upon them. He says, you know, what, what you did was God putting me in place. What was evil, God turned to good. So I tell this whole story because I wanted you to see the ups and downs of what happens to Joseph. I want you to see what's going on. Because right now, what's happening in the world with all this stuff going on with the coronavirus, there's a lot of evil stuff happening. And especially right now for all of you that, that had the end of the school year in sight, that you know, there was a lot of things you had planned. Maybe it was, you know, school dances or, uh, you know, sports or plays or band or, you know, whatever it was, you had that vision. And, and seniors, I'm sorry for this year that it's ending this way, that there's a lot up in the air right now in terms of how does graduation look? How does all that work out? You know, there are all these plans. And right now they might seem a little overbearing and, in fact, there's a lot of evil in it. We know that when the world fell into sin with Adam and Eve, that evil is not God enacting upon us, but instead it's, it's the symptom of a world that has run away from the Creator. And what I want to give you today is a little bit of hope. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it might not even be a year from now, it might not even be two years from now. But my hope and peace for you is that as God works, he will take evil things and work them for good. 
there's a lot of heartache around what's going on right now. There's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of death, there's a lot of hopelessness in what's happening with all this coronavirus stuff. There's a lot of mourning of, of what life should be like, of what we expected it to be like. But what I want to give you today is hope. That God takes evil things and turns them to good. Just look at what Jesus does for us on the cross. There is something evil, there's death there. But God takes it and works death for our good, for our redemption, for our salvation. And so in the midst of everything that's happening in your life, in the midst of all of the unknowns that are happening right now, what I want to give you is this encouragement. Mourn what you need to. Mourn those things that make you sad. Mourn those things that you were expecting. That's okay. But also know that there will be a point where God looks and says, but this is the good that I intended. And you may not see it for a long time. It's okay to look right now and go, well, Lord, I don't see the good. That's okay. Let the Lord work in his time. But know that the Lord is working for good. That there is a Savior who has come. Just, just like Joseph, there's, there's Jesus who comes and suffers evil things for our good. Now, good doesn't always mean that it's going to go the way you want it, right? Good doesn't always mean that, that it's going to be perfect. Good doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. Good means that we look back and see, we see what God is doing in the midst of all of this. So one of the things that's been really nice in the midst of all of this coronavirus, lockdown, quarantine, whatever you want to call it, is getting out a couple times a week, hopefully once a day, uh, with my wife and my dog to go on a walk. And a lot of times that's just in our neighborhood. And we have a neighbor who on a corner fence took chalk and wrote out, choose joy. Choose joy. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. That there is hope that God is going to take what is evil and turn it to good. But today, choose joy. Because joy is not just about your happiness. Joy is about saying, in the midst of everything, I look to Jesus and what he is doing. In the midst of everything, I look towards where he is calling me. Choosing joy encompasses both sadness and and happiness. It can encompass all those things because joy says, the Lord is greater. The work of Jesus is greater. My hope is in him and not in this world. So that's the encouragement I want to give you today is know that God is working this, that somewhere in the midst of this evil, there is good. And it may take time to see that, but look for the good. And while you're looking for the good, choose joy. Choose to rejoice and say, even in what is going on, we can still say the Lord is good. As Easter comes up, we can still say, no matter what virus comes at us, Christ is risen. So live in that knowledge that we have a God who takes evil things and works them for our good that because of that, we get to choose joy. Know that I'm praying for you, Concordia High School. I hope this finds you at home safe. Uh, be praying for your teachers as they figure out how this all works. But keep looking for the good. Keep looking for where God is changing evil to good and choose joy. Amen. Amen.